very good evening and thank you everyone for joining us today i am ankit dogra along with my teammates dr dipika chhabra and mr amit saxena from medical services jackson pal pharmaceuticals limited are very pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar on adolescence health medical concerns organized by sir gangaram hospital new delhi under the aegis of adolescence committee aogd the academic partner for the program is jackson pal pharmaceuticals limited makers of cystelia 35 tablets containing 2 mg ciproterone and 35 microgram ethinyl estradiol also endorec 2 mg tablets of dynages and cyclorex cr10 control release tablets of northestrone acetate 10 mg dear attendees if you have any questions suggestions or clarifications please post them in the q and a box please note this webinar is streaming live on the facebook and the link is shared in the chat box also note for the future reference this webinar will be uploaded on our youtube channel jackson pal medical insights now we welcome the conveners of the program dr mara shivastava past president aogd and dr anita rajoria chairperson adolescence committee aogd and inviting dr mara shivastava ma'am to kindly initiate the program over to you ma'am thanks it's my good evening everyone it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the organizing committee of webinar on adolescent health and medical concerns which is organized by sir gangaram hospital under the aegis of adolescent committee of aogd this webinar is organized together with dr anita rajoria who is the chairperson of aogd adolescent health committee our adolescents should be healthy bubbly so that our future of our country has healthy adults we have chosen few aspects of adolescent health and we hope that all our delegates will highly benefit from today's deliberation today evening we have galaxy of, of star speakers dr anita rajoria dr ruma satpik and panel moderators dr shweta and dr niti tiwari who are going to moderate the panel and we have young vibrant panelists dr sharmishtha garg dr sakshi nayar and dr ankita shrivastava we also have the privilege of a chairperson for the evening dr rajendra singh pardesi dr meena saman dr ruchika garg dr bharti maheshwari dr bharti rajshekar and dr ajay mane with their extreme ex experience they are going to add luster to our scientific program and we also have the privilege of having a chief guest dr suchitra pandit who is a great academician great human being and may i have a madam cv she has been the past foxy president and she is a consultant department of the gynae surya group of hospitals president isopa president organizing gestosis president foxy icog foxy represented to efog president mumbai society of ob gynae pres professor and unit chief lt mmc and lt mg hospital sian she had been the pg teacher for 34 years examiner for md dnb she initiated foxy gestosis hypertensive disorders in pregnancy certificate course conceptualized foxy youth mela she had gcpr 8 guidelines secretary foxy unicef sian kishori adolescent empowerment project madam is very truly versatile person and madam is contesting for the being foxy represented to pigo welcome ma'am we are welcome you as a chief guest kindly address the gathering of the evening with your pearls of wisdom thank you so much mala thank you very much for inviting me and i think what an apt day to start off this topic on adolescent health issues we've all just celebrated the women's day you know uh, everybody's had different kinds of activities and there's such a feel good factor that yes we all are there together and we are going to be solving a lots of issues related to our young adolescents because as mala very rightly said start young you know one third of our population is not even one third little more than that is the you know young people under the age of 25 so it's so very important that the adolescent health committee of uh, aogd uh, 
which is headed right now by Anita Rajoria and Malar Shivasa, both of them together are doing this particular program under the presidency of Dr. Achla Batra. Uh, I think, you know, where Mala is concerned, Mala I know is contesting also for the chairperson's post of the Foxy Adolescent Committee. All the best to her. And Anita uh, Rajoria, another very dynamic person, for contesting for the chairperson of the Medical Disorders Committee. I think, you know, you realize that women are working all over. And as we were just discussing some time ago, that it's not the post, it is the work that counts. And therefore, friends, I urge all of you, we all, yes, we all have elections, we all have to fight for a post, but eventually, hum jite ya na jite is not important. Because if you win, doesn't mean you're very good. If you lose, doesn't mean you're very bad. So your work is what speaks for yourself. And uh, congratulations to both these conveners and to Dr. Achla Batra for having brought forth such a wonderful program. I see that you know the topic of teenage pregnancy is still very much a problem. And Anita is going to be addressing that. And of course, my dear friends, Rajendra Pardesi, Meena Samad, and Ruchika Garg are there. They're going to be you know, actually uh, chairing this particular session. And we all understand that today metabolic issues are central to our problem of PCOS. And I'm sure Ruma Satvik is going to do a lot of justice to that. And I have friends, again, Bharti Maheshwari, who's busy with UPCOG, Bharti Rajshekar, all the way from Hassan, and Ajay Mane from Aurangabad. Again, they're going to be chairing this session. And as Mala had put, you know, the panel on menstrual abnormalities, we still see cases of amenorrhea, you know, AUBs, puberty menorrhagias, precocious puberty, they're still there. So for a gynecologist to deal with them, Shweta Mittal and Niti Tiwari are going to come forth. And we have these young panelists, Sharmishta, Sakshi, Renuka, and Ankita going to be giving us all the answers. And before I log off, let me give a warm welcome to the guest of honor, my very dear friend, Dr. Girija Vag, who is also contesting for the post of Vice President Foxy. And uh, wish her all the best. Dr. Kamal Gujral, again, chairperson of the IOG SGRH, but Mala tells me she's busy, she's held up, but I'm sure that, you know, we have her good wishes for carrying on this program. And once again, friends, please don't forget to, uh, you know, exercise your voting rights. Elections begin on the 21st of March. I'm contesting for the Foxy representative to FIGO, and I really want to work, I want to get FIGO projects because we want to reduce the impact of the environmental hazards on women's reproductive health. I want to work on the NCDs, reducing the NCDs and preventing stillbirths. And of course, adolescence has been very close to my heart because I've worked with adolescents and with the youth mailers, but wonderful to have this gathering and best of luck to all the contestants. I think Ajay is also there. Ajay is also contesting for the VP's post. So good luck to all of us, best of luck. And thank you once again for having me over. Thanks, Madam, for your pulse of wisdom. It's my pleasure again to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Achla Batra. Madam is the president of AOGD. She is the professor, Department of Ops and Gyne, Savdajang Hospital. She also has been president of Narchi Delhi chapter, chairperson Eurogyne committee, AOGD, chairperson rural health committee, AOGD, honorary secretary of AOGD, ex-editor of AOGD. You have held so, so many posts. You have so versatile, a great teacher, very popular with your students and very popular with all the AOGD members. Over to you, Dr. Achla. Kindly bless the evening with your pearls of wisdom. Thank you, Mala. Thank you so much for your kind words. And it's a real pleasure to have the speakers from all over India today. Uh, Dr. Suchitra Pandit, Dr. Girijawa, Ajay Mane, Bharti Maheshwari. I think all have been named, but I just wanted to say it again that we welcome you from Delhi and all the wishes of Delhi people are with you for your forthcoming uh, uh, elections, including to Mala and Anita, who have chosen such a good topic of adolescent uh, for this uh, webinar. You know, Suchitra so Ji has already talked about the topic, so I need not repeat myself. Just to say that adolescent health needs to be taken care of. They are the building blocks of our society, our nation. And if we have good adolescent health, we'll have a healthy nation. 
to my best wishes for you, Vrabindar Mala, and best wishes to all the contestants for whatever they are aspiring for. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for joining. Besides your busy, despite your busy schedule, you have joined. Madam is an, in another event. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining. I just like to say one word. Uh, Dr. Achla Batra is the head of AOGD. He's the president of AOGD, and he is the largest society of Foxy. Let me tell you. So, Achla, you know, you are in a very prime position. And second thing, I'd like to mention that head of the departments is a logo ko dar lagta hai, but you. <laughs> Very rare HODs where you know you're so accessible and you're always there with a friendly smile to help. I've been seeing you for so many years, and you know keep up that spirit and keep up that good work. And thank you very much. And um, uh, with your permission, Mala, I just wanted to mention that Bharti Rajshekar is also contesting for a post of a chairperson. And Bharti, I want to wish you also all the best. Thank you. Yes, we wish it with Bharti also. Yes, definitely with all of you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank madam. You, Achala, madam. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Achla. Now I hand over the floor to Dr. Anita Rajoria to carry on the uh, further program. Dr. Anita. Thank you, Mala. Thank May I have her detailed CV? I want to introduce Dr. Anita with great details. <laughs> thank you, Mala. Dr. Anita is HOD and Senior Consultant, Department of Ops and Gaini, Dr. Hedgevar Arogya Sansthan, Government of NCT of Delhi. Present affiliation, she has, she is associated with the Asia Oceanic Society of OB Gaini, IMA, DMA, and you name it, and she's a member of all that society. Major achievement, founder, Vice President, Delhi Gaini Forum Southwest, past chairperson, Reproductive Endocrinology Committee of AOGD, out, Outreach Committee of NARCHI, Member Reproductive Endocrinology and Fertility Committee, Member Endocrinology Committee, Breast Committee, Food and Drug Committee of Foxy, National Trainer and Trainer Satsa, Lakshya, Daksh, Daksta. Many, many, many honors and rewards to you, Dr. Anita. APJ Abdul Kalam Achievers Award and Appreciation Award, Inspiring Gynecologist of North India Award, Foxy Friends Award. And thank many, you, many Mala. Awards. Thank you. I think it's enough. Thank you. Thank you yes, so yes. much. You are such a comprehensive person. You need to be discussed and talked about. Over to you, Dr. Anita. Thank you, thank you Mala. You are such a dear friend. Thank you so much. Now, it is my proud privilege to welcome uh, none other than uh, Gerija Ma'am. Professor Gerija Vag is the professor of OBG Wine at Bharti Vidya Peet Medical College Hospital, Pune. She is senior consultant, Cloud9 Apollo Hospitals, Pune, faculty professor, international expert, general coordinator of OGASH, chairman, medical disorders and pregnancy committee, FOXI, 2012 and 16. Ma'am, you, you have been such an inspiration that I will now wish to, you know, try to get to this, uh, this post and uh, try to do justice to this work. She is Vice President, India Chapter Gestosis, Member Governing Council, ICOG, Joint National Secretary, FOXI, Assistant Coordinator, National Eclampsia Registry. Ma'am has been conducting so many, so many webinars and uh, training programs uh, as far as gestosis is concerned. Member Central Supi Supervisory Board of PCP NDT Act, National Mentor Lakshya for Ministry of Health, peer reviewer of so many journals, course director, study for OBG and Anandi Bai Joshi awardee for excellence in medical services. Ma'am, we welcome you. Uh, Dr. Kamal Gujral is busy, shows, so she is not able to join. Ma'am is the chairperson of Institute of OBG Van and uh, Sargangaram Hospital, New Delhi, and she has conveyed the best wishes uh, for this webinar. And we are all uh, looking forward to hear from uh, learned panelists and speakers uh, in, further in the webinar. So, Mala, we will wait for Girija ma'am to... Yeah, we will wait for two minutes. Yes. Let her rejoin. First and foremost, <laughs> thank you so much, Suchitra Pandit, madam, for being always there to guide us and help us and, you know, give all your pearls of wisdom. I remember a long time back when she had delivered a talk in our society. One of her colleagues from MRC, we were very we were juniors, we were just listening, and then she said, for Suchitra... If she has to give us the substance, you can give one entire day. Still, there will be lots to learn from her. And that is how you have always been an inspiration, madam. And you please continue to be there to inspire us. 
i also want to thank dr anita for giving me such a wonderful introduction dr anita and that speaks volumes for your love for me and it's really really important the way you introduced me and you appreciate and yes gestos score is really helping so many obgyn specialists in the entire country and i nearly every day get some sort of an input on this particular issue thank you so much dr mala shrivastava madam for having this wonderful webinar and i'm sure because i always feel that adolescent healthcare is something which is so important and today with the changing lifestyle our definitions are going to change we saw there was a question in our chat group immediately because really there are so many questions so many standards that we need to establish when you investigate what is what about the metabolic syndrome in the adolescents and so many other issues that we have to deal with so i'm sure this webinar is going to be a grand success and i'm here listening to all of you and learning from you and hello dr meena dr rajendra pardesi sir dr bharti rajsekhar jika thank you thank you for being here and it's nice to connect to all of you dr ruma and my dear dear friend ajay mane ajay is my small little brother hello to you <laughs> so thank you thank you girija ma'am for those pearls of wisdom and now i hand over the further proceedings to our dear mlc dr vidhi naran over to you didi didi is a clinical assistant gynae endoscopy unit at sir gangaram hospital so we uh, now we are ready is a young vibrant enthusiastic yes. gynecologist of our hospital so over now to you, dr didi thank you ma'am uh, yeah, thank you ma'am good evening everyone program. thank you ma'am so, uh, so yeah thank you ma'am uh, so we'll start with our first uh, topic for the uh, for the uh, discussion today medical concerns with teenage pregnancy i would like to invite the chairperson for the topic uh, dr rajendra singh pradesi sir uh, vice president amox for 2020 to 2022 and sir has presented many uh, papers in national and international conferences and sir has also been a vice president of foxy uh, 2019 to 2020 uh, we welcome you sir and now i would like to invite dr meena saman uh, ma'am is senior consultant and head of department at kurji holy family hospital patna she has been chairperson clinical uh, foxy clinical research and ma'am has secretary journal isopub 2019 2021 ma'am has published many papers in reputed journals and chapters in multiple books we welcome you ma'am thank you so now coming to our third uh, uh, chairperson i would like to invite dr ruchika garg uh, ma'am is professor in department of uh, obstetric and gynecology at sn medical college agra Ma'am has been a joint editor and a journal of uh, SAFOG, that is South Asian Federation of Obstetrics and Gynae, and she has been awarded with many multiple awards and has published more than one twenty papers. We welcome you, Ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Riddhi. Uh, now I would request Dr. Rajendra Singh to invite speaker for our first session, that is Dr. Anita Rajwarya. Good evening, everybody. First, I wish to congratulate. <laughs> organizers for having this wonderful webinar on adolescent health now to introduce dr anita rajoria basically our introduction has been done but main thing just see her introductions she has worked a lot in the reproductive endocrinology committee infertility committee family welfare committee food and drugs committee iic committee and i wish to add only one in her biodata as she is contesting for the post of chairperson medical disorders in uh, pregnancy for foxi i wish every success to dr anita rajoria now madam uh, we wish to hear you on teenage pregnancy thank you thank you so much thank over you. to dr anita rajoria thank you sir thank you for your nice introduction and your blessing so i am going to share my screen so the topic uh, assigned to me is teenage pregnancy the medical concern so we all know that adolescence is a period of rapid brain development alongside social and other cognitive changes that prepare adolescents to transition to adulthood the lancet commission for adolescent health and wellbeing highlighted 
the opportunities and challenges in improving adolescent health in the world among the key cha challenges for better health of adolescent is the adolescent pregnancy and the health outcomes of mother and fetus so what are the causes of teenage pregnancy what leads to this maybe this is the curiosity or experimentation in uh, in short or peer pressure or some family related uh, problems which lead to this there is lack of information about uh, sexual health contraception and then there is influence they say of liberal uh, views on the sex now uh, the physiological abilities psychological abilities social and cognitive abilities adolescents of adolescents also make them prone for uh, getting pregnant in teenage there is lack of education and information about contraception then uh, there are other factors and there are you know there are so many social factors they are not able to approach the healthcare services so all these lead to uh, pregnancy and its continuation every year an estimated 21 million girls aged 15 to 19 years in developing regions become pregnant and approximately 12 million of them give birth at least 7 lakh 77000 births occur to adolescent girls younger than 15 years in age the estimated global adolescent specific fertility rate has declined by 11.6% in last 20 years uh, now the uh, overall adult, adolescent fertility rate as estimated in 2018 was around 33 we see that adolescent fertility rate has declined but actually the childbirth to adolescent has not decreased because Uh, due to the large and in some parts growing population of adolescent young women in the age group of 15 to 19 years and we see that largest adolescent births they happen in eastern asia or western africa now there are 10 million unintended pregnancies which occur each year among adolescent especially in the developing world complications during pregnancy and childbirth they are the leading cause of mortality all over the world if we estimate around 5.6 million abortions that occur each year among adolescent girls between 15 to 19 years majority 3.9 million million are illegal and unsafe this further contributes to maternal mortality morbidity and long term health implication we all know that adolescent mothers they face high risk of eclampsia puerperal sepsis babies of adolescent mothers also face risk of being low birth weight preterm delivery and having severe neonatal problems so it's a global issue especially in high middle and low low income uh, country all over the world adolescent pregnancies occur more in marginalized community because we all know that it is due to poverty it less uh, illiteracy and poor employment opportunity other factors which lead to are uh, because these girls are under pressure to marry early and bear children early uh, we have seen that at least 39% of girls they marry very early and Uh, even before 15 years around 12% of uh, girls are married off before they achieve even 15 years of age so adolescent who get pregnant there are many factors they have lack of knowledge about contraception they otherwise also face barriers accessing to contraception services because of our restrictive laws and policies like box says that she may get afraid she may not reach to the healthcare worker and then worker bias also plays a very important role we ourselves are so much you know biased towards these adolescents who are coming to ask for contraceptive advice and there is lack of willingness to acknowledge adolescent sexual needs we are not very empathetic to them and moreover these adolescents they don't have access to contraception because either they don't have transportation they don't have knowledge or they have financial constraints they don't know where to go 
Additionally, adolescents may lack the agency or autonomy to ensure the consistent use. They may start using contraceptive, but to continue with their use is a big problem for them. So, at least 10 million under unintended pregnancies occur each year among these adolescents, especially in developing regions. An additional cause of unintended pregnancy is sexual violence, which is more than a third of girls in developing countries reported that their first sexual encounter was by coercion. Now, when we discuss the uh, medical problems related to teenage pregnancy, it is very, very important to touch upon the nutrition, which is required in pregnant and lactating adolescent age group. The adolescent fertility, we all know, is three, uh, three times higher in lower and middle income countries because of contextual factors we have already discussed. We must uh, put more impact on uh, this fact that there is competition for nutrition between the mother who herself is growing and the baby which she is carrying. They say that some studies were done and they say that women Adolescent women were able to grow if their nutritional requirement was met properly. But if the nutritional access was poor, it may have uh, less maternal growth and the final stunting of mother herself may be there. So it is an established fact that whenever energy is constrained, the physiology of younger uh, uh, adolescent, it invests in the growth of adolescent herself while these energy, this energy is uh, more put into reproductive adipose tissue for further reproductive carrier of herds. When an adolescent becomes pregnant, there is increased risk of becoming stunted and adverse neonatal outcomes. We will discuss them in details like low birth weight baby, preterm delivery, maternal anemia, postpartum poor outcomes. And there may be excessive weight retention also in these uh, adolescents. Adolescent girls are two to five times more likely to die from pregnancy related complications than women of age group of 20 to 29 years. They have high chances of stillbirth, neonatal death, as well as increased risk of preterm birth, low birth weight babies. These health risks further increase for girls who become earlier, early in a pregnant in early adolescent in comparison to adolescent who get pregnant around 18 to 19 years. Nutrition in pregnant teens is crucial since their bodies are not physically ready to bear the child. And these girls, they tend to give less priority to their nutrition despite having enhanced needs and especially it is seen that uh, adolescent girls with low body mass index, whose body mass index was less than 18.5, they significantly had increase in perinatal uh, risk, including all the neonatal complications. So this should be the ideal pregnancy weight, what, what should be the calorie allowance, extra vitamins are required. So we have to sit with these adolescent pregnant girls and give them proper nutritional counseling and maybe a nutritionist may also be uh, um, taken in the team for proper uh, nutritional counseling. So these are the dietary allowances for pregnant and uh, lactating adolescents. You will see that protein, uh, protein uh, requirement also increases in pregnancy and lactation and carbohydrate markedly, uh, you know, you see the market increase which is required in pregnancy and lactation gradually vitamin requirement also increases so on and so forth so it has been seen that who, mothers who had the calorie restriction or malnutrition they had further issues because their babies also were prone to develop problems later on in life we all understand the fetal origin of adulthood diseases so this is regarding the same then there is another side of the coin also. In general population, it appears that teenagers are less likely, likely to acquire pregnancy weight than older pregnant women. But if we see that preeclampsia is said to be lower in these adolescent girls, 
but it was seen that if the pre pregnancy weight was more the adolescent was obese there was excessive weight gain during pregnancy and it further increased the risk of pre eclampsia among adolescents these overweight adolescents the fact that prevalence of obesity among adolescent girls is increasing so globally we need heightened awareness of the health implications for the current and future generations thus prevention of overweight and management of obesity among adolescents is the another side of the coin and we have to advise them lifestyle and nutritional programs and it is a need of urgency for all international bodies all over the world so the uh, you know increase in excessive weight gain may cause elevated rates of diabetes heart disease among affected women and their offspring also uh, it has been seen that adolescents who were themselves exposed to maternal preeclampsia as fetuses they showed marked functional changes in their heart including greater relative wall thickness and uh, ventricular and diastolic volume was less compared to control at risk adolescent girls were more often they the more often have low birth weight babies and babies born were premature and they had much more neonatal death if some baby survives these survivors will have elevated risk for chronic conditions themselves they might develop hypertension over life span they may have early onset renal disease type 2 diabetes mental health uh, mental health problems and other chronic conditions and it was seen that uh, babies born to adolescent mothers they were more likely to become adolescent uh, parents in their life later on Uh, if we talk about if we talk about uh, lactating adolescent mothers her micronutrient status determines the health and development of her breastfed infant especially during the first 6 months of life nutrient needs during pregnancy and lactation are higher relative to other physiological states we all understand that and it was suggested that interventions to improve the status of pregnant women resulted in statistically significant improvement in mean birth weight of the neonate so the intervention strategies included the provision of micronutrient supplementation especially calcium zinc in addition to iron and folic supplementation so we all understand that long term nutritional counseling is required in these pregnant adolescents now what about babies pregnancy and childbirth complication are the leading cause of death among girls we all know that adolescent mothers they have higher risk for eclampsia urinary infections peripheral endometritis and systemic infections we have already highlighted increased maternal mortality mortality morbidity and lasting health issues regarding babies they have low birth weight and severe neonatal condition and if by ill luck she has rapid next pregnancy then it is a concern of a greater uh, it is a greater uh, concern for all, all of us because it pre presents further he health risk to the mother as well as the uh, child so mothers are faced with malnutrition poor general health there may be severe anemia in these adolescent girls they may uh, often present to your clinics or hospital for admission with hemoglobin which is less than 7 there may be uh, there may be incidence of antepartum hemorrhage hypertensive disorder we have already discussed so it is a major concern it is a serious matter and it entails considerable risk for complication during labor also there may be placental accidents prolonged and obstructed labor and there may be uh, long term consequences like obstetrical fistula there are more chances of emergency cesarean delivery because we we know that these girls they have not achieved their final height and their final size of pelvis so they are more li likely to have emergency cesarean section there is high heightened postpartum depression in these girls and they can't uh, initiate breastfeeding properly it was seen which further increase the likelihood of fetal and neonatal complications later on in life especially during early 6 months of uh, 
um, neonatal period. They are, we have already discussed this, that the gest baby has less small for gestational age babies are there. Then there is an added risk of major congenital malformation for obvious reasons because they are nutritional, uh, nutritionally deficient. There is more like they are more likely to have congenital malformation, and they do not seek uh, healthcare. So these congenital malformations may not be detected in time, and these babies are born with major congenital anomalies. So we need to give give these high risk group adolescent pregnant mothers special attention during pregnancy labor and delivery also what are the other problems they may be emotional and psychological problems they may develop it is seen that during early pregnancy seven out of ten teenage girls do not seek medical attention because either they are unaware or they have poor health seeking behavior or they do not have access to health care they are more likely to have STIs and HIV. And uh, they may pass these infections to their babies also. They uh, may develop emotional problems like anxiety, depression, stress because of obvious reasons. They have long-term poor weight gain. They continue to have malnutrition, poor growth. And these mothers, unfortunately, they do not develop the expected final adult height. Regarding baby, baby inside a woman's womb depends on its carrier. 9% of teenage, uh, teen girls have low birth weight babies. And these were low birth babies, we all know that uh, they have uh, um, inadequate organ development, they may have poor lung development leading to respiratory distress syndrome, there may be brain damage and the birth asphyxia at birth. So these babies are having these long-term complications. Preterm birth has its own problem. Then major congenital malformations, I've already discussed that they may have neural tube defects, cardiac and gastrointestinal malformations. And there is increased pre and post discharge neonatal morbidity and mortality. So teenage pregnancy has long-term effects and risks. It has social and other implications also because we know that social health is an important part of health by WHO definition. So long-term long social health consequences are also there. These girls are likely to have more school dropout, which may jeopardize their future education and it may hamper their further employment and opportunities. And demand for education is so high to find a good job, these uh, girls are left in a lurch because they cannot earn for uh, themselves later on in life. They land up into financial problems. Social life is bad. They cannot mix with other children of their uh, peer age group. They miss out on their own childhood. And bringing, bringing up the child becomes now the responsibility of the adolescent girl's parents. So it uh, becomes like a added uh, responsibility to her parents. Mother may feel depressed, she may feel inadequate because she has poor parenting skills. And she, if she wants to join the school again after delivery, then it also becomes a problem because, uh, because of the attitude of the school, peer attitude and other social stigma may be there. So what we all can do about this? So we all know that Millennium Development Goals in this Millennium Development Goal era, it is our utmost duty. It was decided by WHO uh, in an epidemiological based uh, action. WHO, uh, they developed preventing early pregnancy and poor reproductive outcome in adolescent developing country strategies was there. Especially it was offered to countries who were very much interested in um, uh, adolescent health issues. So they used to develop and test program support tools so that how we can implement these uh, adolescent uh, healthcare uh, um, services to improve their health and how to deal with uh, teenage or adolescent pregnancy. So the uh, motive should be preventing first pregnancy in adolescent and, and subsequent pregnancies also. So what we can do is we have two take care of their good education because it 
it's the education which empowers these women to seek healthcare behavior their improve their health seek, uh, seeking behavior we have to invest in health uh, system also so that our health system is more receptive more empathetic to these adolescents and we understand their requirements so uh, improve, we must improve the uh, quality of care antenatal intrapartum and postnatal care to prevent mortality and morbidity in these young mothers so we must understand their specific health needs and try to prevent the long term morbidity and mortality in them the crux of the issue is awareness about sexual health and contraception is the most effective way to prevent adolescent teenage pregnancy preventing further adverse outcomes both to mother as well as her baby so in the end i will just reiterate that women from disadvantaged ethnic groups have higher risk of pregnancy during adolescent age and adolescent girls who do not have access to education they are de also deprived of sexual education sexual information you know, about health consequences of unwanted unplanned pregnancy because if they they, they are poorly educated they no, do not gain that decision making power to access and navigate the health services contraception and education i again reiterate they are the two very important tools to prevent adolescent pregnancy adolescent mothers are more likely to have prolonged labor preterm birth small for gestational age babies and higher incidence of congenital malformation increasing the load to the already stressed system for neonatal care attention to the high risk adolescent group during pregnancy and labor and postpartum phase also it needs special emergent um, this is a very important issue which needs immediate attention by all the health uh, care providers so thank you so much thank you for uh, giving listening here thank you so much thank you dr anita madam for this elaborate talk and where it is quite less discussed topic and um, so the root cause we need to go it's an important cause of school dropouts and so the issue of contraception and sex education in young girls should be brought out so madam has very beautifully uh, demonstrated all the effects on the mother on the neonate the congenital abnormalities but how we should address it so we should uh, educate the girls about sex and to prevent uh, i mean this she should have sex education and the use of contraception uh, by either condom or long acting reversible methods of contraception they should be used and so that um, these things can be avoided so i must congratulate anita madam this thank you thank you dr ruchika so rajender sir will like to say something uh, it was a really nice delivery by dr anita rajuria just i wish to add one thing teenage pregnancy she has narrated very nicely all medical and social issues also nowadays the medical legal issues are upcoming because of the poxo act below 18 if delivery comes so uh, we have to do police case or at least inform to police now whether to do deliveries or not or if any uh, anything they will say no no age is 20 and something goes wrong with 16 and cases happened on the gynecologist so i think this point should be taken with dr uh, ajay mane dr uh, girija wag and dr suchitra pandit ma'am because see uh, delhi is a metro but still all more than 50 60 percent population is village area if now government are thinking of um, increasing the age of marriage on 21 21 is not possible in rural area then they will say if below 21 pregnancy is there then what is the role of gynecologist only to do police cases or inform police and then do delivery then this will be the justice of teenagers also this we should think and proceed thank you thank you so much dr girija can, can i highlight something? on this can yes I yes say dr it? girija yes yes, yes. dr uh, anita your talk was excellent very very important very vital and what i felt was when we are thinking of doing sex education there's something called as sex wisdom maybe some such kind of a banner we can come because you and me 
and then all the group discussing with each other is not going to help yeah. we have to reach out to the community we know that uh, to an extent dr shanta kumari dr alpesh they did try to go out and speak to the society in their little way but all of us have to have doing this constantly because you can see now poxo suddenly became very popular because of manzrekar you know that person who is doing movies also doesn't know that this will invite a abnormal reaction if you are not right legally i think that is a step forward that you know showing atrocities to children and women on screen has been taken objection about and then while we are looking at the challenges with um, sex and related issues unfortunately we are giving a lot of negative um, uh, image Man. also around sex now while the community is evolving on one side we are still going backstage so therefore we have to all together collectively especially with dr rajendra singh pardeshi suchitra madam who has been doing adolescent health for such a long time all of us need to come together and use some collective wisdom in trying to reach out beyond our clinics and foxy to reach out to the community how we can bring out this in a better scientific way and if we are not able to do it we are missing that bus really seriously and anita yes. i wish you all the best for your election and i want you to come out with flying colors because medical disorders and proxy committee requires a person like you at its leadership thank you thank you ma'am thank you girija ma'am for those kind words ma'am very rightly said because these restrictive laws like poxo uh, means i am sharing my own experience because as soon as we start discussing this uh, poxo you know poxo related uh, words when shared with patient they just try to run away yeah yeah just simply because they don't want to land in problems and i am afraid that this may cause further increase in illegal abortion so that is an issue we i would want a social forum by rajendra singh pardesi to create and we want i want to discuss my experiences with patients with poxo really i am telling you okay. and we want yes, just to just yes sir yes, 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 as girjam girjam madam said correctly the uh, proper age of poxo act must be 16 not 18 that is the main mm -hmm. uh, reason and if it would have been uh, 16 no 99% of the cases would not have been there it would have been have 16 yeah so you know, we, can, we can totally, like to urge, we can totally we can yeah Like yes, you yeah. know, Girija and Ajay, you are now, you know, going ahead for the vice presidency, and we have, Ma, Ma, you know, Mala who's going to go for the adolescent committee. Fight together and try to get this change. I'm telling you, 2014 when I was Foxy president, how many times this petition went through the ministry? How many times we have told them because the Poxo Act problem had started. But you know, yeah. they yes, they agree with everything. but for that to change for that law to get amended mtp took so many years but with a persistent effort with all y'all there now at the helm of this please go ahead and do it and make that you know big big voice and try to change that thank yes, you ma'am true, true. very truly said by suchitra madam it is correct thank you ma'am thank you yes and anita ma'am it was nice lecture thank you thank, thank you, you. ma'am thank you sir so okay and dr anita congratulations for that wonderful Talk you. that you've given uh, as uh, you're going for medical disorder, pregnancy in teenage itself is a medical problem overall. Yes, I would say, yes, not only a medical one, a social and a legal one, as every Dr. Rajinder Singh Pardesi and Dr. Ajay Mane and they've pointed out. And I think in last few, uh, I've heard Dr. Mane at so many forums and. Dr. Dr. Pardesi talking about this, bringing it out, and as Dr. Girja Ma'am said, then I mean we have the law, but what to contain it? We must realize that you know the sexuality in our adolescents it is very much there, and even young girls when they come to our school, going going girls, they are into relationship. It's not a secret. It's they're quite open about it. Uh, then uh, then having a act like this. Um, i mean it doesn't really answer to our, our prayers uh, really and then again um, we can say that a sort of uh, deprivation syndrome go goes on education and then like you mentioned the figures from 33% to 11 okay they've come down but the rate of uh, abortions again is pretty high in this group 
so it is a kind of problem that we have to face and address in a bigger way. And uh, I think overall, we all have to get together because uh, we know it's a problem pregnancy to avoid it, to address it even you know going for contraception if we think that it is illegal then you know people won't come out openly for it so a uh, thank you it was a great yes. to cover each and every aspect and uh, sir added to the legal aspect yes, which is uh, talk of the town these days and um, i think all the best dr anita dr gilja madam suchitra i mean dr ajay mane dr rajshekar all of you dr mala Yes, ma'am. All such deserving candidates we need. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, yes, very well highlighted by you. The adolescent fertility index rate has come down. But we all know that all over the world, the younger population is rising. So actual number of teenage pregnancy is on a constant rise. So this is an important uh, problem which is going to stay for a while. And we must all, all together address this issue with utmost sincerity and empathy. Thank you, everyone, for your nice comments, your nice carry home messages. Over to Organ again. Um, MOC, dear, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. There, there are a few questions in, yeah, in chat box. Ah, there are a few questions. Yes, we can take them. Uh, can you, uh, Riddhi, can you read the question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Ma'am, so first question is, what is Z score and how do you calculate? And how much obese teenagers should increase weight throughout in pregnancy? So uh, we all know that uh, Asia, in Asian, our scores are lesser. We, we know that 23.5 to 25 in adult, we take it as uh, overweight and above that is obese. So in Indian Asian population, uh, I think the criteria remains same for the adolescents also. So uh, they, if the mother is low birth weight, then you advise or let them or allow them to have around 10 to 12 kg of weight gain. But if the mother is falling into overweight or obese cat uh, category, we might as well restrict their weight gain to around seven to eight kg. But we must give enough calorie allowance for because mother is also uh, growing. We have to give allowance for that also. So we have to a bit, uh, we have to be a bit careful in obese adolescents. So that is the concern which has to be addressed properly. Uh, this question was by Dr. Ajay Um, and this was the only one question. Really. Thank you for that question. Hope I am clear. So we can move ahead, dear. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And I will thank all the uh, chairpersons. Now moving on to our uh, next topic, that is dilemmas and diagnosis and management of adolescent PCOS. I would like to invite chairperson Dr. Bharti Maheshwari, ma'am. Ma'am is professor and head of department of Ops and Gaini at Muzaffar Nagar Medical College. She has been an author or ed an editor of many textbooks. And ma'am has also been chairperson FOXI MCP committee 2018 to 2020. We welcome you, ma'am. Now I would uh, invite Dr. Bharti Raj Shekhar, ma'am. Mm -hmm. She is uh, ma'am is medical director and obstetric gynecology consultant at Vatsalya Hospital Hassan. Uh, Ma'am is also KPMEA State Vice President and also Director Indian Red Cross Hassan. Uh, welcome you, Ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so moving to our third chairperson, Dr. Ajay Mane. Uh, sir is uh, President at Aurangabad Option Gaini Society. Sir is also Chairperson Website Committee, AMOG. And Sir is also Member National Inspection and Monitoring Committee, PCP and DT Wing. We welcome you, Sir. Uh, so now we welcome Dr. Duma Sathvik, uh, who is the next speaker and the Designation Consultant, Center of IVF and Human Reproductive Production, Associate Professor of Reproductive Medicine, uh, GRI, Jipmar, and uh, workplace is Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, the renowned hospital of Delhi. Then field of interest are research, male and female infertility, 
fertility enhancing laparoscopy and hysteroscopy and her experience is of uh, i don't uh, understand this 1916-12 years okay post dgod and bnfmb so overall she is having uh, much more experience she is very uh, knowledgeable and stalwart so i <coughs> invite and uh, request her to kindly proceed with the lecture on the adolescent pcos romama thank you dr rajay for that introduction I feel like I'm the weakest link in the chain here, but very honored to be chaired by uh, the distinguished faculty here. Thank you. C can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you need to put it yes. on full screen. Thank you. Yeah, okay, right. Uh, so that's the topic we're talking about. Right. And the question is, uh, do we even need a discussion, a separate discussion on PCOS when it's a topic that's been done to death in adults? Uh, so we understand adolescent is a separate category and it might pose diagnostic challenges. The concerns in uh, PCOS adolescents might be different from PCOS adults. And because they are still in this phase where the reproductive access is not maturing, uh, the management in these individuals could be different from adults. Uh, well, we're basically going to try and make it a case presentation, and uh, this is like a, a typical case of what an adolescent PCOS might present as. So our uh, lady here is NS. Uh, she's a 16-year-old female who uh, comes in with uh, complaints of irregular periods since onset of mensets at 12 years of age. And as per her, the periods were initially uh, happening at two to three months, but have reduced in frequency to a point where uh, they ha have only happened three times over the last year. And the last period, in fact, was three months back. She doesn't remember when. And the flow is not very unusual. It's three to four days. She describes it as a light flow. Now, the question is, a lot of us or some of us may just dismiss this as an irregularity of adolescence. And the question is whether this constitutes menstrual irregularity in adolescents. We understand that the reproductive access is maturing in girls and that a, an occasional missed period or some delay in periods is completely acceptable in adolescents. So what is the international consensus on what constitutes menstrual irregularity in adolescents? Uh, now, we use the word menstrual age here, wherein we take the number of years since her menarche to denote her menstrual age. And it says that any missed period for more than 90 days, three, three cycles, would be considered a menstrual irregularity even in the first year since menarche. Thereafter, in the second and the third year, periods as long as 45 days would be okay, but beyond that would be considered a menstrual irregularity. And after three years of having had menarche, if the cycles persist at less than 21 days or more than 31 days, that would constitute menstrual irregularity. Now, a lady seems to have all, all the first two characteristics. In addition, the international consensus on PCOS also denotes no periods till age of 15 years, actual chronological age of 15 years, or no periods uh, uh, despite at least three years having elapsed since breast flooding would be constituted as menstrual irregularity. So a lady definitely has the first two symptoms. So this would be considered a menstrual irregularity. So that is done. Now, uh, NS also has history of coarse dark hair growth on the face and lower abdomen. It has progressively increased over the last two to four years is what she says. And she now shaves in fact, uh, two to three, uh, uh, this is every two to three days, that's about two times a week. She has also noticed progressively worsening acne on the face and the back. Again, the question arises as to would this be um, an irregularity in adolescence? Uh, because acne, we know, is, is a very common feature in adolescents. We also know that some, you know, a little down around the lips could be considered absolutely normal in young girls. So would we call this abnormal? Uh, what would be considered her suitism in adolescence? Now, now this is uh, the international body has deliberated on this and, and it's, there's not a very strong evidence there, but it says if it is bothering the adolescent, it has to be considered significant, right? And so now these all these eight, Perriman-Galway score of eight, six, four could be different in different populations. 
But here in India, at least we, the papers that have been uh, submitted and have been published would use a scale of more than eight to consider uh, her suitism as being significant and requiring treatment. Of course, it has to bother the girl for you to say that, yes, this is bothersome, it needs treatment. Second is that if it is progressing, uh, progressively increasing to a point where it reaches, you know, from let's say score four, you had a sister six months earlier, and now she's from four to eight, that definitely requires evaluation. So that is her suitism. What about acne? Acne again is a less uh, sort of talked about topic, and we tend to kind of uh, again push it under the carpet because acne is such a common uh, symptom in adolescence again. So if you look at this figure, that there are three kinds of acne. One is comedonal second is inflammatory and third is nodulocystic. Comedonal is what one would call the white head or the black head. And inflammatory acne is, again, those less than 5 mm, mm lesions, either pustules or papules, and again, nodulocystic. So this apparently is very common in adolescents, and up to 10 lesions is considered totally all right. Or a mild form, 5 to 7 lesions of this occurring sort of once or twice, like one crop in a month is also considered okay. What would be considered abnormal is persistent acne, severe comedonal acne, so you do actually a lesion count, and that's what dermatologists do. Something more than in the different, different ways to kind of grade the severity, mild, moderate, and severe. And this one has been picked up from the uh, dermatology uh, journal. So uh, about 30 or more comedonal acne would be considered severe comedonal acne, a result of androgen excess. Moderate to severe inflammatory acne, once again, 10 or more lesions of this kind would be considered abnormal, right? So now this, uh, when we go back to our lady, uh, she is uh, has a body mass index of 28 kilogram per meter square. She's of weight 71.5, height 1.6 meters, waist circumference 90 centimeters. And mother, of course, so while you see this and you check on whether she has recently gained weight, mother says that no, she has always been healthy and that's the term that most mothers use for their kids. Her blood pressure is 140-90, her suitism is present on upper lip, chin, perioreolar area, lower abdomen, inner thighs, legs, giving her a score of nine. Comedonal and papular acne is present, acanthosis nigricans has been confirmed on neck and in the armpits, those are the areas where one would commonly look, but the other third place is under the breast, that is also where uh, dark uh, discoloration could happen. No obvious cushing void features, breast exam is unremarkable other than the perioreolar hair and development stage is four. Systemic exam is normal. So this is the case history and the examination. What should the next step be? So we have uh, a young girl who uh, seems to have menstrual irregularity, even by the definitions put up by the International Committee. Uh, or, and she seems to have signs of androgen excess. Would you label her as PCOS? Would you do an ultrasound? Would you do blood tests? Would you do no more tests? And you know that this is the case and I can start treating. Or would you deliver the diagnosis and start treatment, right? So this is basically uh, a part of part, uh, point three. So uh, we get to ultrasound, and this is where I want uh, all of us to pay attention, is that, so what is this international consensus that I'm talking about? The international consensus is uh, a group of 40 bodies that came together in 2018 and came out with different points uh, regarding PCOS. It was not just on adolescents, but on adults, their different presentations, features, treatment, and all that. But they have a long passage on what constitutes normal for adolescents, how they should be handled, what treatments they should be given. And as per them, ultrasound for the diagnosis of PCOS in adolescents is going to be, uh, bring, uh, it, it's not going to be very accurate. And the reason is that there is a high incidence of multifollicular ovaries in this life stage. Polycystic ovarian morphology is considered a normal finding without a reproductive anomaly in girls at two to four years gynecological or menstrual age. And adult criteria for PCOM is based on TVS, which should, would be avoided in women who are not sexually active. And adolescents, we would expect most of them to not be sexually active. And ovarian volume increases between ages 9 to 20, peaking at age 20. So we don't even have appropriate cutoffs for what ovarian volume would be considered abnormal. So we don't have cutoffs for what 
what AFC is would be uh, normal and we don't have cutoffs for what volume would be normal. We also don't have the right means to measure this in the absence of transvaginal scan. And hence, the body recommends that ultrasound for diagnosis of PCOS in adolescents is not recommended till the gynecological age under eight years. So if the lady has had her menarche at, two, uh, at 12 years of age, till 20, the ultrasound would not give you a reliable diagnosis and it increases the risk of overdiagnosis. So, but would you do ultrasound for other reasons? Yes, in this case, I would definitely want to order it to rule out other pathologies. Remember that she's shaving at a frequency of two to three times per week, and that's quite significant, even for someone at 16 years of age. I would want to rule out androgen excess arising because of other uh, conditions like ovarian tumor, adrenal tumor, and of course there is uh, amenorrhea. So one would want to look at any uterine or endometrial pathologies that can do this. So what about hormonal tests? So uh, that was the first thing that we have addressed on uh, ultrasound. What about hormonal tests? We follow the golden rule, rule out pregnancy. Any woman 16 above, uh, let's say, the age of menarche presenting with amenorrhea, rule out pregnancy. Do a thyroid test, do prolactin test to rule out these abnormalities because these have separate management. But, but would you order the whole plethora of... Uh, sorry, uh, of uh, hormones that constitute hyperandrogenemia. So that is testosterone, DHEAS, 17-hydroxyprogesterone uh, and all that. Would you want to do all of that? Uh, there is a small case for this to be, for these tests to be ordered in a case uh, such as NSS. And that is that if, in her case, clinical hyperandrogenism is very clear. So I'm not going to order it for diagnosis, but I may order it to rule out other conditions because again, there is a sign of sudden rise in androgen activity in her body. So I'd like to order the uh, biochemical tests in these cases for establishing diagnosis, which is the test I'd like to order, testosterone total and free. And remember that uh, certain uh, assays have been, di did, uh, have been kind of uh, designated as being standard for testosterone total and free. The others don't give a very, very reliable result. And these uh, assays are liquid chromatography mass spectrometry and extraction chromatography immunoassay. So if your center is doing any of these, maybe these total testosterone and free testosterone would be reliable. Otherwise you go back to the good old uh, way of calculating what is known as bioavailable testosterone and which is can be done through free androgenic index. And the formula for that is total testosterone into 100 divided by sex hormone binding globulin. So SHPG and total testosterone can be done in most laboratories. Uh, what about androstenedione? and DHAS, both of these are products of the adrenal glands, but about five to 10% may also come from the ovaries. PCOS is a ovarian hyperandrogenism disorder, and we are trying to detect hyperandrogenemia from the an ovarian source, but because five to 10% also comes off androstenedione and DHAS also comes from the ovary, it is likely to be raised in about 5% of the individuals. So it is not my first line investigation. It is only when testosterone total and free are high would I order an, an uh, are normal. And I suspect high, uh, sort of I suspect PCOS on a very strong basis, I'd like to order androstenedione and DHAS. Uh, so another important point to be remembered here is that all of these tests, whatever you order here for hyperandrogenism would be affected by OCP intake. So you need to have at least three months of break from OCP before you order these tests in order to get the true picture. Now, the next, this is again a very commonly performed test, FSH, LH. Do I need these for diagnosis? The answer is no, I don't need it because only 40% of the people of individuals have an abnormality in that ratio, in FSH, LH ratio, 60% of the individuals will not have it. What about, uh, but I may order FSH and LH only if I'm suspecting some other kind of anovulation, type one, which is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or type three, which is hy hypergonadotropic hypogonadism another word for ovarian failure. So only if I'm suspecting these would I want to order FSH, LH, E2, not otherwise. AMH, no cutoffs have been established either in adults and definitely not in uh, adolescents. So that is not to be ordered to diagnose 
PCOS. What about tests for insulin resistance? Yes, but it comes with lots of riders. The only validated test for insulin resistance is hyperglycemic insulin clamp, which is a clunky, which is a kind of a cumbersome test. You need to admit the patient. You have to need, have an IV line going on one side through which glucose is being administered. You have to have an IV line going from the other side through which insulin is being con uh, administered. And you need to have blood tests done for insulin levels and glucose levels every half an hour. Clearly not a test. Uh, as an outpatient setting. So that is, but that is the only uh, validated test for determining insulin resistance. Insulin values, fasting and PP are not validated, so not to be ordered. So the best, next best surrogate for determining insulin resistance is the good old oral glucose tolerance test with 75 gram glucose, right? With values of 112, whatever we consider, 110 to 126 as being glucose intolerant for fasting values, and 140 to 199 being considered as glucose intolerant for postprandial values. So uh, this was our case. This is the 16-year-old where menstrual irregularity has been established. Signs of androgen excess have been established, clinical androgen excess. We ordered the ultrasound. It revealed unremarkable uterus and ovaries. The KUB was normal as well, so that the adrenal glands was not enlarged. Endocrine testing revealed high total testosterone, high free testosterone, normal 17 OHP, normal DHEAS, and oral glucose tolerance test was, of course, in the, uh, the postprandial uh, value was in the higher limits, so showing intolerance to glucose. So uh, uh, coming back to finally the diagnosis, I'm going to spell it out to you. Rotterdam's is what we have always followed. Uh, two out of three criteria having ruled out androgen excess sources from uh, uh, other conditions. So here are five and all five have to be followed. Menstrual irregular, irregularity, the way it has been described hyperandrogenism or hyperandrogenemia, and I've given you a lowdown on that, absence of other causes of androgen excess, ultrasound diagnosis not needed and not to be ordered till the, at least not to be relied on for the diagnosis of PCOS till she's uh, eight years post menarche, and AMH, FSH, LH is not needed for diagnosis in the adolescent girl. So delivering the diagnosis, now that we have the diagnosis here because she fits into all those five categories, uh, sensitivity is needed. So this is a 16 year old girl. And if I go ahead and tell her that this is what you have and that your ovaries are that you are secreting too much of the male hormone and that you're going to have this all your life and that you need to get put your act together and do things fine. Of course, I have to tell her all that, but it has to be done in a very sensitive way. Young girls take very badly to kind of, you know, any, um, uh, sort of uh, assault on body image. And uh, that has to be done very carefully. So also that the international body recognizes that any of these signs may be present in adolescent as a growing up, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a regular sign of growing up. And so we shouldn't overdiagnose and at the same time not underdiagnose. In adolescents with isolated features, you keep the girl at risk and reassess after three years to see if some of those features have gone away with time. Now, what are the concerns in adolescents that are different from adults in management? Management is pretty much dependent on the same lines that here, it's pretty much the same lifestyle, pharmacotherapy, acne treatment, laser epilation. But lastly, we will find that there is a lot of uh, anxiety and depressive symptoms, eating disorders in these individuals, and that that has to be recognized, that has to be assessed, that has to be appropriately addressed, treated as and when. So this would be an additional concern in adolescents. Uh, now, lifestyle is something that is very easily said than done, and we kind of just uh, uh, say it, you know, and that's really not the way that it's because the kind of effort, energy and, and time that you need to put into actually convincing the adolescent about her weight and about losing is actually not a joke. You probably, if 15 or 20 minutes is what the consultation time is, that is exactly what you're spending or maybe more on trying to convince the girl about what is necessary. So now inform why a healthy BMI is necessary. And we all know that through Dr. Rajoria's lecture, and of course, you know what it can do to you later in life. Uh, BMI targets are different for age in adolescents, and this is what I wanted to bring up. These are Indian Academy of Pediatrics uh, BMI charts. I remember that girls, let's say 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 
ha have their 50th centile for normal, which is much less than what is there for adults, okay? So even for their height, the 50th centile for normal for a 16 year old girl would be at 20 or 20.2, that's her BMI. But 50th centile for normal in an adult woman might be higher, it, it, above 18 might be at 22 kg per meter square. So those BMIs are different, you need to be aware of that. And at what point to intervene is what someone asked is when they cross that level, when they cross the 95th centile, and this might be very different, is when the intervention needs to start. Of course, you start uh, advising them about healthy lifestyle right from the beginning. Now, when you have that target ready, we kind of break that down into short term, six months, six months, six months, what to achieve in the first six months. So set short term targets, incorporate advice around routine of the individual. So if this is a girl who goes to school every day, takes, goes to the bus stop, walks, was being dropped by her father to the bus stand. You can at least ask her to walk maybe about whatever it takes, 500 meters or whatever, start 10 minutes early from home. Similarly, if there's a market that she has to go to, instead of taking being being dropped uh, to the market, she could walk to the market. And, and, and there are a lot of changes that can be brought about. Methods are behavioral change, dietary, calorie restriction. We know all this, so I'm not going to go into the details. I'll just tell you how this girl was managed. And follow-up is essential at monthly intervals to confirm goal attainment and alternately to identify issues associated with failure. Uh, the next thing that we manage these girls with, because there is period irregularity in her, there is period, uh, th there is uh, signs of androgen excess. Uh, both of these would need or necessitate OCPs. This is uh, a PCOS would be managed best with OCPs. Cycle regularity more with OCPs than with uh, progesterones, even in the adolescents. I understand that parents bring up concerns about height ka kya hoga, would her weight worsen, would her metabolic status worsen, and there's enough evidence to tell us that uh, this is not likely to. Okay, so the best, the most, the the, the advantages, of course, here that we are seeking are uh, established establishing regularity and volume control, simultaneous reduction in acne and hirsutism severity, and uh, what kind of uh, OCPs to pres prescribe third and fourth generation are equally effective, any available preparation with estradiol, uh, uh, ethanyl estradiol between 20 to 35 micrograms, and any of these third or fourth generation progesterones can be used. Final height is not a concern. Girls reach their adult height by age 13 or 14 at the most. And but beyond that, you could prescribe OCPs easily. OCPs in adolescents do not worsen weight or metabolic issues, and there's enough evidence to tell us this. However, you need to rule out contraindications before prescribing OCPs. And two of the commonest contraindications would be a history, personal history or family history of DVT, and a personal history of the breast cancer would be rare at this age, but a family history of breast cancer. So how long, as long as it takes, uh, that's one another common question, should we give a break? Well, you could stop after two years to see if spontaneous regular HPO activity has been established because PCOS worsening or, or the severe symptoms are known to get better with passing age. And that is something that one can uh, look at. And uh, however, it may be restarted after three to six months if regular menses have not established. Okay. Now, metformin is again based on consensus. OCPs and metformin. Metformin are uh, very commonly used and useful medicines in PCOS, adolescent PCOS. What is the dose? It's actually very high, 1500 mg to 2000 mg a day in divided doses. Helps with establishing menstrual regularity, weight control, improving metabolic parameters. It may improve acne as well, and that is not as per the international consensus, but as per this randomized control trial. So acne, there are a whole, whole lot of treatments, topical and oral, and we can talk about it uh, another day for lack of time. Emotional well-being has to be assessed. Hirsutism, acne, weight contribute to lower self-esteem and depression. Remember that this is a girl to whom uh, image matters a lot. And this is not just for girls, it's also for boys in that age group. And a lot of uh, what your self-esteem is, is based on how you look, how you appear, how you speak. Uh, so uh, 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 
you you can't kind of just build on that saying no it is there in you or whatever because all of this will tend to cause low self esteem in her that has to be recognized how do we do that check on her sleep check if there is a eating disorder whether she's avoiding social gathering is there excessive nervousness irritability around things that she e easily partake in activities in school so if suspected send for assessment and treatment by a therapist or a physician so clearly we are not the ones who will be treating it but recognition is our job so coming back to ns ns was if you remember uh, 71.5 kgs and uh, a 10 percent weight loss was initially targeted ideally for a 16 year old a bmi the ideal 50th centile bmi would have been 20.5 which would have meant a weight of 55 kgs that would have meant a weight loss of 16 kgs so clearly that was something that we didn't want to target right away seven kgs was what we were targeting over six months at the rate of one to 1.5 kg per month which is not unattainable seven kgs is equal to seven one kg is 70 seven thousand uh, kilocals right so that's the fat converted into energy 49,000 calorie deficit, which comes to 300 calorie deficit per day. And if you divide it, it's 200 calories through dietary restriction and 100 calorie through exercise. Now, what is advice? Now, you have that in your head that this is what you're trying to achieve. Diet one meal in the day to be carb free. Start meals with fruits or salads. Throw sweetened beverages out of the fridge. Avoid snacking. And all of this is happening while there's a behavioral change in the family. Entire family has to undertake this because you can't expect just this girl to make these changes while the mother and there are no role models for her in the house. Exercise target was 150 minutes of monitored moderate activity per week. Walk to nearby market, school, bus stop is what she was encouraged to do. Walk while chatting with friends because this is what a lot of teenagers tend to do. So even while messaging, or she was encouraged to walk around and not to sit on the sofa and do this and help mother in everyday chores. Ethanol, estradiol, 30 micrograms plus drosperinone, uh, 3 mg was started for six months. Started metformin, 500 mg, thrice a day was started. Started at once a day and incrementally stepped up every week by one tablet till three tablets a day were tolerated. For acne, we gave her body wise 2% salicylic acid face wash cleanser at night, clindamycin phosphate gel, 1% twice a day application. And she was followed up if in the first month, third month, sixth month, 12th month. Weight at six months was down from 71.5 to 65.5 kgs and at 12 months to 63 kgs. Reports reduction in shaving frequency. However, the thing is still bothersome for which we plan to re refer her to uh, uh, for, for epilation, for laser treatment. And blood pressure, LFT, lipid profile is normal despite being on OCPs. Plan is to stop OCPs after one more year of use and to see if the HPO axis has returned to normal. That will be all. Uh, uh, thank you so much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Ruma. That was a, a very crisp uh, talk about uh, managing this very difficult adolescent uh, PCOS. Uh, but uh, here um, you said that, yes, ultrasound is not necessary. I think that's a very good point to be taken home because we know the, compl the complexities of doing a transabdominal scan in an already obese individual. And the other thing was... Uh, uh, yes, OC pills, we all of us too put them on OC pills for six months to one year. But I have a question here. When do we stop? Because very often we see that once we stop OC pills, they're back to square one uh, in spite of their weight loss and uh, behavioral changes. So uh, the consensus on how long it can be given has not been specified, but is generally believed that it is safe for up to five to seven years also. The risk of breast cancer later in life has not been studied in adolescents, but may be given safely for five to seven years. Whatever breast cancer data we have is for postmenopausal women or perimenopausal women using uh, uh, OCPs or estrogens beyond their ages of menopause. So uh, can be safely given. I do uh, agree that uh, most of them may not return to normalcy after stopping OCPs, but some of them do. Some of them, the severity, oh, yeah. essence, it's not because of OCP. Yeah. It's a natural cause of PCOS is such that the severity of the symptoms do come down with as the passage of time that that's because you know even the ovaries uh, so yeah that's the answer uh, can i add uh, to that point ruma it is pcos uh, is a is a syndrome which goes along your lifespan because yeah. it may change uh, uh, your, your uh, requirement for treatment 
with advancing age the girl at present is presenting with acne hirsutism later on may 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 need treatment for infertility and then later on in life with development of hypertension diabetes and so on and so forth so it's, it's a full spectrum of disease so how long to continue ocp is a big dilemma to answer the thing is that you can uh, advise these patients some drug vacations they can take for 4 5 years and stop for a while and then they can restart so that 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 way it, it is like a chronic manageable disease like diabetes or hypertension so uh, there was one question regarding z score uh, for bmi uh, i want to answer that that there are age and sex specific graph which are there for bm which is which are called bmi z bmi z score so the, the, these uh, are available on net and uh, if the it, it depends on the deviation they they do the calculation by standard deviation of the weight they have charted the uh, weight of boys and girls and they have taken standard deviations into account then they made they have made this uh, mm -hmm. graphical analysis and if you find that z score the comparison between the actual uh, weight and height of that particular index adolescent is between 1.04 to 1.64 then it is the overweight and above 1.64 is the obese adolescent because they wanted to know what is the exact amount of fat actual fat mass in that growing adolescent so bmi may uh, may give a fallacious response as uh, ruma has also reiterated it because the, these are the growing adolescents to 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 know the actual uh, you know what is the actual uh, body mass index and what is the actual muscle mass what is the fat mass so they have uh, made this z score bmi z for that and you can uh, plot it on the graph and if you are uh, if you are adolescent the index adolescent is between Uh, less than 1.04 that is normal more than 1.04 to up to 1.63 is overweight and 1.64 and above are obese children so that way you can uh, monitor them uh, on a long term uh, basis yeah thank you dr anita there are few questions in the chat box if you take them uh dr ruma there's there was one question which is already posted in the morning in our group where dr sadhna jaiswal wants to know what is the right age when one should start paying attention on the diet and physical activity and also when should we start addressing her mental status to address this obesity and health issues i think a very pertinent question here yes ma'am uh, but i think there is no right age to start it has to happen right from the beginning the uh the fads of uh, bringing in coke and pepsi and those on the colas and you know the chocolates and getting the children addicted to uh, all of these things. you know all these that that has to be the mother and the father and every all the adults in the house have to be sensitive to that issue and uh, frankly you know going back to the good old ways of cooking at home and uh, not eating out of a packet I and mean, that's the thing that is used for uh, individuals or the suggestion that is given to individuals who are trying to lose weight uh, do not eat out of a packet eat uh, food that is cooked at home i think that has to be followed right from the beginning so you don't start when the damage is done you don't exactly. start when she's you know let's say you know 70 kgs this has mm -hmm. to be instilled in her Earlier. you know very in, right even a 6 or 7 year old may be troubled by his or her classmates even in nursery kg or a first standard for that matter they may be teased for being overweight by their classmates so you can't uh, set a lower limit means you have to take care of that child also if the child is going towards obesity we need to you know take care of that so ruma has very uh, high, uh, very importantly brought out this point So there is no no low the earlier the better age. yeah sooner the, the better earlier the better i think and the dictum should be eat the traditional regional and, and the seasonal food and we don't understand these these children they go through lot of stress you know they means they they they, they, they are growing they don't know how to tackle this uh, body image issue and all that and especially with growing adolescent it becomes a very very big issue 
So we have to strike uh, them at the. Yeah. There are another couple of questions. If we can take them, I would request. Uh, is it okay? Yes. Uh, can I just say something, Dr. Anita? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The thing which I wanted to just say, because there's a question also to that extent here. One of the uh, challenges that we have in our day to day practices is when do we really start the combined pills? Because we are always concerned about the fusion of the joints, one and starting estrogen so early in that very young child. And many of us decided not to start progesterone to begin with. And then maybe somewhere around the end of uh, commencement of teenage life, we then would start giving them a combination pill. So is this a right practice or there can be challenges? 13 might be, yeah. So 12 might be early. 12, 13 might be early. One has to wait for the fusion of epiphysis to happen. Yeah. What estrogens would do is accelerate uh, the process of fusion. It might happen earlier than usual. So that might affect the final height. So I did mention in the talk uh, about how uh, final height attainment in girls happens earlier than in boys. And it stops after age 13 or 14 at the most. So uh, girls with uh, issues might you know, come to us or period irregularity might come to not in the early part. So first year, probably the mothers avoid bringing the girls as it is first or second year. Third men, third uh, year of having had them in our case when third or fourth is most likely when they present to us with all these issues. By then, usually girls would have had their final height attainment. And starting them on OCPs beyond age 14, I don't think any one of us should have a problem. Uh, meanwhile, we can tide over this period by giving progesterone. Uh, Means we stress. should counsel mothers that it's okay that the girl gets four periods in a year or so. So uh, that we can counsel uh, both mother as, and, uh, as well as baby and we can them, uh, give them withdrawal. We can give, uh, give withdrawal every uh, 89 40 days, 35 to 40 days. Uh, Dr. No, Ruma, there's one more question. Uh, sorry, yeah, madam. Somebody wants to make a no, I just had I just had one more question. You know, when we are talking about deferring OCs, uh, there are times when the girl at 13 and 14, she's already got a full-blown PCOS, she's got hirsutism, she's got... So then progesterone is just giving it for the, you know, uterine uh, stabilization. is not... Mm -hmm. like, Ruma, at that time, we may need to use either... Then just use ciproterol, but you don't have just plain ciproterol here. Yes. Or move on to using drospirin. Now it is drospirinone is available mm -hmm. as a molecule. What would you suggest in such situations? All right. See, I usually see girls being brought in at least two years, at least after having attained their final height. So two years or three years after having attained menarche. Usually age 12, 13 or 14, if they have come 12 or 13, I mean, I know that they have reached wherever they are, their mother's heights or above that. I wouldn't go to the extent of actually getting x-rays done to check their epiphyseal fusion or whether or not this has happened. Uh, but if her, so, so bleeding, if that is a bother in terms of volume, so frequency for frequency, I'll not give her recipes frequency as in if that is the only concern she has, but if irregular prolonged excessive bleeding is a problem because of PCOS, which can happen, it didn't happen in this case, but it can happen, then perhaps progesterones in those case is perhaps the best answer. If if the answer, if the question is with acne or hirsutism and body image and periods as well, then progesterones don't address it. OCPs then be <clears throat> given, but be wary and be sensitive to the uh, idea of final height attainment. So maybe kind of wait it out uh, another for some more months before you start some kind of reassurance. Some, some. Right. Very right, Ruma. There's a question also. If there is excessive bleeding baby in an adolescent of 12 years, what to do? So I think you have partially answered that question. Yes. And uh, yes, we can offer them uh, tranexamic acid. These tablets, they can tide over some time. We can control the bleeding. And if not, then progesterones come to help us. And mm -hmm. even if progesterones are not having their action, we cannot allow her to continue to lose blood, then we can give them a combination, I think. Yes. We have to rule Anita, out bleeding disorders. In yes, ma'am. Girls, young girls. In and such a situation, would it be smarter to give, you know, or not smarter, preferred maybe, to give her estrogen yes, and then uh, give her progesterone later part of the, you know, the one which we usually do for primary menorrhea or things like that? Will it be better than the cyclical? Yeah. 
So give the estrogen, estrogen that progesterone, progesterone and then continue that way at least for a period of an year. Would that be better? No. No. I, I don't think so because yes, sequentially, sequentially it won't control anything. It won't control okay. anything. Because combination the, pills are ideal. Uh, in Dr. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Ruma, and what about metformin? Uh, how mm -hmm. long would you advise that? How early should we start and how long should we go on? So metformin, oh, yeah, metformin is specially recommended for obese adolescents. And uh, as soon as you have made the diagnosis of PCOS, or at least two of those uh, features are present, Metformin uh, can be started. It helps, and as a standalone drug, it helps in improving period frequency also. Apart from helping in weight loss, weight loss, of course, best achieved through lifestyle management, but maybe about a 10 to 20% contribution in terms of weight loss can be had through metformin. And then again, there is improvement in the metabolic parameters, lipid profile, uh, not testosterone so much, but uh, sugar levels. And those are the things that are likely to improve. So metformin is a useful drug to be taken. At some point when she has attained her goal of the ideal BMI, one could stop metformin. There's another question. What's the role of the myoinositols? So myoinositol has not been studied much, but it is meant to improve the glucose transport into cells by recirculating what is known as the GLUT4 transporter. That's the receptor. Uh, now, uh, why has it not been studied enough, either in adults, as in we don't, it has been studied enough, but we don't have recommendations from international bodies, you know, when it comes to myelinosis at all. So I guess I just have to hold it there, my opinion there, because we don't have, and personal uh, experience with myelinosis at all does not exist, but it is meant to improve insulin sensitivity. Thank yeah, you, regarding Dr. that question about puberty menorrhagia, Dr. Bharti, it is very important. These patients should have at least one ultrasound if they are not yes. responding to treatment. And you have to rule out other problems. Coagulation bleeding disorders. disorders. Yeah, yeah. That these Infections are also and bleeding disorders. Yeah. Well, Dr. Ruma, I think it was an excellent discussion because uh, the any number of sessions we have on management of adolescent PCOS, we are again many of very often in our clinical setting back to square one. So we have to tailor make the uh, management according to the individual and of course uh, spending time with them on uh, counseling behavioral changes along with the family is a very very important component which you did stress so i thank dr anita and the entire team for giving me the opportunity to chair this session and on this platform i humbly request all of you to kindly support me for the chairperson of the family welfare committee and over to dr riddhi i thank you for allowing me to chair this session Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Congratulate Dr. Ruma and all the chairperson for having very interactive session. The panel has been postponed because uh, two of our panelists are not are busy. One of our panelists is having fever, the other one is busy. So we'll have the panelists panel discussion standalone in the next session. Uh, we will request Dr. Ajay Mane, who is ready with his lecture on uh, medical legal aspects of MTP. So we'll request Dr. Ajay Mane to go ahead with his lecture. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Basically, I'm 12th player uh, uh, made available today. Uh, respected Suchitra ma'am, uh, who is uh, from my own place. Respected Achala ma'am. Respected Girja ma'am, my sister and Kamalji. And Anita Madam and Malasri Vastu Madam. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the platform. <clears throat> Litigations in case of MTP. I have put some uh, scenarios basically. Uh, patients came with a pregnancy of 17 weeks for MTP. And her age is 17 years. What next? Just now we discussed about the POXO Act. The POXO Act applies here. I have heard so many consultants uh, uttering it as a POSCO, POSCO. It is not a POSCO. It is a protection of child from sexual offenses. As everybody discussed, uh, details um, uh, we all know. Less than 18 years, married or unmarried, both to be reported to police. 18 completed, uh, not starting. 17 completed, 18 starting is not uh, an adult by law. Law says that 18 year completed is an adult. And if she is less than 18 year completed, we 
are bound to inform the police in return and have a result from them because police may deny that Dr. Mani has informed me. Okay, so that is for sure that you need to inform the police. First thing, <laughs> or the Child Welfare Committee, but it is not available everywhere. So police is a better uh, option. Secondly, if you do not inform the police and if uh, um, anybody informs the police and the case goes on, you are liable for a six months imprisonment. Six months jail ho sakti hai for not informing the police that is the uh, provision made in the amendment in 2019 uh, the law was basically of 2012 as suchitra madam said 13 14 may she has fought uh, at various levels but the government do not uh, reply basically this is lobby they do not reply okay so six months imprisonment is there and if your subordinate has done some uh, crime in the POXO Act, and if you do not inform the police, then you are liable for one year in prison. Aapke niche ke kaam karne wale kisi ne agar kiya hai ye guna, aur aapne inform ne kiya, so you are liable for one year. And jis ne kiya ho, inform ne kiya ho. Next situation, okay. Patient came with pregnancy of 17 weeks for MTP and her age is 17. Same, same situation. Whose signature is essential? Okay, aap dousra question ye aata hai ki isme humne MTP karni hai ya nahi karni? So, so POXO Act says just inform the police and you treat the patient. You are not a judge. So, you are not a judge. So, you are there to provide the services. You inform the police and it is not a life threatening condition. So, wait for the police to come, have a statement, and then go for the MTP. And as she is 17 years, here, the signature of parent or a guardian is required, not a legal guardian. There is a difference between guardian and a legal guardian. Who is a legal guardian? Who is having a legal custody of that child is a legal guardian. And who is a simple guardian? Guardian can be a, a, a accompanying person. Uh, then maybe a father, mother, friend, boyfriend, or uh, maybe aunt or anybody. Okay, That can be a guardian. And POXO reporting is very must here. And Moreover, if she is unmarried, then preserve the products of conception in normal saline for seven to two hours. Inform the police in writing that we have preserved the products of conception to be handed over to you. Kindly take it and keep it in a refrigerator. It can be kept for seven to hours, not in formalin. Keep it in a normal saline. And after seven to two hours, if police do not take it, then it's their discretion. But you must have a receipt from them. Ki you have informed. Clear. Next situation. Patient came in bleeding and infection. She had attended by quack or taken MTB. Uh, sorry, it is a pill, not bill. Uh, through quack. How can we proceed? Say a patient is in uh, maybe in septicemia or shock. She may land in DIC or whatnot and maybe bleeding. So inform police as it becomes an illegal abortion and something goes wrong, then you will be held responsible for that. Your notes on the admission is very important what it says it says that the patient was in which condition firstly secondly it gives history of patient having treatment some at some other place and you are not uh, held responsible for that okay so you are saved so the negligence part is taken care the consent part is taken care so documentation part is taken care so you are free you can treat the patient if she is in uh, Say, for an example, very bad condition, life-threatening, shallow breathing or pulseless or whatnot, then if it is a life-threatening condition, you must treat her. You can deny the patient. That is your right. But in which condition? If she is not in life-threatening condition, at that moment, you can deny. I can't do treatment, I can't do MTP, I can't do it, I can't treatment, I can't do it, I can't do it. But life-threatening condition, it is uh, binding to you to treat the patient. Okay? Inform the police, MLC KJ medical legal case, or Chitra Kiya received, and then you may go for the further treatment. Need not wait for the police. In POXO Act also, it is written that you should uh, not wait for the police, but it is better to wait for the police. This is from my uh, side advice. Okay, next situation. Police calls you and demands case papers of MTP. You performed two years back as girl filed case against that boy as a rape case. This is very common nowadays because the boy and girl, they may have physical relations for two, three, four years and uh, maybe after four years, some quarrel, uh, then uh, departure and the girl files a case. 
as a rape. How can it be a rape? Uh, uh, obviously, it is not a rape. A rape is a sexual activity, uh, maybe penetrative or non-penetrative in uh, any one of the orifices. I am telling you the legal language uh, without consent of the woman or the girl. If uh, she is more than 18 years and if she is less than 18 years, with and without consent is a rape, basically. Previously, what it was, if she is married and it is done uh, by the husband between 16 to 18 years, it is not rape without consent also. But uh, nowadays, it is less than 18 years with or without consent is a rape, more than 18 years with consent is not rape, without consent is a rape, basically. So, so very simple definition. But here, they have enjoyed three, four years and now the girl filed the case and they uh, maybe uh, she might have come to your place at the age of 21 years, criteria is completed age, she is major, criteria is completed by your MTP center, criteria is completed by you as a official person and uh, the failure of contraception is there, everything is fine. Okay. And nowadays in amendment of MTP, they have given right to the unmarried woman also to use the um, fifth option as an opinion failure of contraception, which was not there previously. It was available for married women. Now they have given the chance for the unmarried women also. Means they consider that unmarried girls also having sexual activity. So what is the procedure? Oh, police ne aapko bula liya, uh, ya to phone karte, madam, aisa aisa hai, ya to phir, uh, ek admi bhej diya. Kya karein aap? You need to give photocopy of the uh, indoor paper to the inspector after receiving a return Letter from him. Agar unhe move se bolte hai ki nahi, madam, bhai, ko bhej do jara photocopy aap. Don't send it. Ask him politely to kindly send it in the written form. Because see, giving any information of any MTP to any person, except civil surgeon and MOH, is a uh, basically breach of the law and there is a imprisonment again. Uske liye ek saal ki saza hai. Pehle hajar rupee fine tha, abhi ek saal ki saza ho sakti hai. For losing the confidentiality. Now, inspector ko de rahi hai, losing of confidentiality hai ki nahi hai? So, nahi hai. It is a cognizable offense, means on his own, the police officer may start the investigation. So, police officer may demand it. Agar usne aapko bata diya ki hum ko hi chahiye, sir, letter de do, usne letter bhi de diya aapko, ki mujhe such and such documents mujhe, <coughs> sorry, chahiye. So, you give a photocopy, don't give original. Photocopy dijiye uske, Print out kijiye uska pura, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right upper corner uska numbering kijiye and hand it over to the person who is coming to you or hand it over to the uh, police station uh, jamadar and usse received lijiye ki I received 7 pages of indoor paper from such and such hospital and keep it with you. That's all. And aapka statement bhi le sakte hai. So give a statement ki mere patient patient aaya tha, patient jab aaya tha, 21 years ka tha. So, so we perform MTP, uh, that was the situation and that's all. You are free. डरने की कोई बात नहीं ओके तो आपको ही इंस्पेक्टर को ये देना जरूरी है दैट इज मैंडेटरी बाय लॉ ओके अब ये नीचे के दो जो दिए हैं ये बहुत कॉम्प्लिकेटेड मैटर है इसमें डिटेल में नहीं जाऊंगा वी आर लेट फॉल्स प्रॉमिस ऑफ मैरिज इज डिफरेंट एंड ब्रीच ऑफ प्रॉमिस ऑफ मैरिज इज डिफरेंट ओके ये फॉल्स प्रॉमिस ऑफ मैरिज में ये पूरे रेप के केसेस बन रहे हैं आजकल के पर सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज क्वेश मैक्सिमम केसेस वो ब्रीच ऑफ प्रॉमिस बोल के कॉम्पेंसेस दे सकते हैं नेक्स्ट सिचुएशन पेशेंट केम फॉर यूएसजी फॉर पेन इन एब्डोमेन पेशेंट इज 16 ईयर मैरिड and found pregnant of eight weeks. What next? So I told you, married or unmarried does not make difference for POXWAT. Less than 18 years, married, unmarried, to be informed. So sonologist must inform the police. In one case, the sonologist did not inform. Sonologist sent back the patient to the uh, gynecologist and gynecologist sent the patient to civil surgeon. And uh, invariably, the police lodged the case and the court summoned both of them why you did not inform the police. So the show cause notice was there. So, so whosoever come to know that the patient is pregnant must inform the police. An NGO or Mahila Ayog or anybody coming for inspection, can we show the documentation of MTP? No. Only civil surgeon, MOH or the medical officers to whom the delegation of authority is done. They have a letter of delegation of authority by civil surgeon. He, uh, Dr. Ajayman is sent uh, with the delegation of authority to inspect the MTP. Uh, documentation then and then only these fellows or these persons are allowed to see the documents no NGO, no mahila ayo not nobody nobody even uh, minister mukhyamantri pantradhan bhi aa gaye to aap unko dikhane sakte ki sir ye mujhe bandhan karak hai main aapko bata nahi sakti hum dono jail mein jayenge that is the, the law is 
फॉर एवरीबडी ओके इवन सो क्लियरली से नो पोलाइटली से नो उनका इगो हर्ट नहीं करना है हम लोगों को पोलाइटली से पेशेंट विथ साइकोलॉजिकली डिस्टर्ब कंडीशन अ लेटर फ्रॉम साइकेट्रिस्ट ऑफ हर ट्रीटमेंट फर्स्टली बिकॉज ड्रग इंट्रेक्शन कैन टेक प्लेस सो इन कंसेंट फ्रॉम गार्डियन और वार्डन वाई बिकॉज इन कंसेंट इट इज सेड दैट द साउंड कंडीशन ऑफ माइंड एंड बॉडी इज इसल फॉर गिविंग अ सिग्नेचर ऑन द कंसेंट हियर द साउंड कंडीशन ऑफ माइंड इज नॉट देर पेशेंट इज साइकोलॉजिकली डिस्टर्ब शी इज अंडर ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ द साइकेट्रिस्ट सो कंसेंट फ्रॉम गार्डियन और वार्डन इज रिक्वायर्ड दो शी विल बी अ मेजर पेशेंट next question do we need to change our mtp registration certificate from appropriate authority as change from 20 weeks to 24 weeks now the amendment has took place gazetted everything since october and some of the uh, appropriate authority they are asking to submit the old one because uh, there it was written ki uh, second trimester abortion up to 20 weeks now it is 24 weeks but in gazette they have mentioned that 20 weeks should be replaced by 24 weeks it is deemed early given so no need to change the certificate from appropriate authority okay can we terminate pregnancy after 24 weeks and after 28 weeks obviously say they have given uh, two categories up to 20 weeks one person previously it was up to 12 weeks uh, one doctor opinion 12 to 20 weeks two doctors opinion now they have made it a 1 to 20 weeks one doctor opinion from 21 to 24 two doctors opinion at our hospital and Uh, if it crosses 24 weeks then it should be sent to the medical board and when once it sent to the medical board within 3 days the medical board should either say yes or they should deny if they deny they should give the reason in form d and after that 3 days the consultant need to terminate the pregnancy within 5 days so it is a matter of 8 days within 8 days it should be finished and uh, no. <coughs> okay the next thing i'll tell you uh, in is failure of contraception available after 20 weeks up to 24 weeks failure of contraception is made available for unmarried girls also or women also in uh, amendment but it is not available beyond 20 weeks okay that is the amendment they have done it so after 20 weeks up to 24 weeks they have given rape cases minor widowhood or uh, certain geographic conditions or severe uh, anomalies form these are the five cases and uh, the uh, opinion form is form e in routine condition up to 20 weeks the opinion form is form i it is not one it is a uh, no, sorry it is one it is not i it is a roman one okay then next question is usg mandatory before mtp by law it is not mandatory but my opinion it is a mandatory uh maybe uh, advice from my side it is mandatory why it tells about two things one whether it is a intrauterine pregnancy whether it is a extrauterine pregnancy tubal pregnancy or whether it is a heterotopic pregnancy if you give tablets considering that it is a intrauterine and say for uh, uh, uh incidence that it is a tubal pregnancy it gets rupture and patient is in shock many uh, instances we have seen uh, we are fighting three cases about that so patient was having active pregnancy so diagnose the active pregnancy you can have cervical movement tenderness or the fornax tenderness but when the tube is stretched then and then only it is tender if it is not stretched it is not tender we have seen so, okay, many cases like that and maybe uh, cervical tenderness or the fornax tenderness may be there um, uh, due to another reasons also so it is not a confirmatory test that so how to diagnose then the tool is best tool you have got is a ultrasonography transvaginal sonography in early pregnancy and the abdominal uh, sonography in late pregnancy also you can diagnose as a intra or extra uterine and go for the uh, mtp after sonography okay and second thing it tells about gestation age you are having first trimester abortion uh, permission and say for an example the patient uh, proved to be 13 weeks or 14 weeks borderline patients and you are in trouble then so diagnose uh intra uterine extra uterine secondly the gestation age and go for the termination next question is it mandatory to mention missed abortion incomplete abortion inevitable abortion and blighted ovum in mtp no it is asked in uh, uh, right to answer the central government and the government of maharashtra 
they also uh, replied that they are obstetric complications. They do not come under purview of MTP. So do not enter them in form three that the MTP register 23 oblique 2022. There you should not write. It. But government of Maharashtra had made one uh, additional uh, register where we can enter this. But you need to go for the suction evacuation or dilatation cure or whatnot. So have a separate indoor paper, have a separate consent for that. You need not have that C, which is mandatory for MTP cases. C is mandatory. Okay. Uh, but uh, here you can have a separate consent. Take two consents. Always. One for procedure, one for anesthesia. Anesthesia needs separate consent. Mind it. Okay. Anesthesia needs separate consent. Anesthesiologists need to write separate uh, notes. Procedure consent separate, procedure notes uh, separate, and it is to be maintained in your obstetric indoor papers. Okay, so no need to. So this is a slide which tells you about uh, the complete steps. Step number zero, just the patient while speaking with them. So some ambiguous patient, like I told you, unmarried uh, major patients, they come in a, a good mood and afterwards they will file. So at that moment, have a consent in form C, plus additional consent you have to take. What additional consent says? That this pregnancy took place with the consensual sexual activity with my boyfriend or a friend, whatever, okay? I don't have any grudge or I don't have any complaint against anybody or in future. Likewise, you can have a one second undertaking. One is C consent and second is undertaking and you are safe. Because afterwards he says, Ki mujhe leke gain waha, uh, abortion karaye. undertaking so we are free. You solve there. But we are free. We should not become a accuse number three or four. Step number zero. Then step number one. OPD registration with ID proof and counseling. OPD ke ID proof is very mandatory. You have date of birth. Ka bhi aapke ek proof hona maybe Aadhaar card, maybe driving license, maybe passport, what not. But you should have a photo ID plus date of birth ID. Then and then only you can proceed with the complete procedure and counseling okay take the consent of the patient in form c and additionally i told you complete the form one for up to 20 weeks e 21 to 24 weeks doctor supreme form then complete the mtp actual procedure then step number five complete paperwork operation notes etc and step number six put these three forms c one and notes in an envelope and seal it and hand it over to the either uh, owner of the hospital or if you are the owner of the hospital keep it in your consulting room on which the number is uh, put the consultant's name and the time and date and every month you need to send a complete summary before 5th of each and every month it is mandatory if you do not send it it is a breach of law okay uh, this is the last slide PCP and uh, difference between PCP and MTP. Okay. One consultant may have many centers as well as can go to many centers for MTP, which is not possible for PCP and DT. You can go to two centers only where your name is written. But in MTP, if the uh, place is recognized, I am recognized, I can go to, uh, say, uh, Girja Ma'am's place and I can perform MTP on a proper patient, which suits in that five uh, conditions. Okay. It is allowed. Then one may perform MTP at any recognized approved center, I told you. No regular inspection mentioned in law. For PCP and DT, they have mentioned that every three months inspection must take place, but in MTP, that is not the condition. Though they come, but it is not in law. No renewal. It is lifelong registration. Once you register for MTP, it is lifelong. No renewal. But in PCP and DT, you need to renew after five years with 50% of the charges. Say for an uh, example, uh, for... Um, USG, you need to pay 25,000 initially. So on renewal, 12,500. If it is a ERT center, uh, it was uh, it is 35,000. Then it becomes a 7,500. For MTP, it is free. First time they may charge uh, some amount, but uh, no registration, uh, sorry, no renewal is there. Fine. Place approved and not restriction on person. I told you, non valuable cognizable and non compoundable I'll explain the terms, okay? This is last slide. non valuable means what? You will get the bill, but the bill is granted by the uh, first class judicial magistrate. Till that moment, you need to be hand, to be there behind the bars. Police will take you. They will put in the chowki and they will uh, take you to the court. Maybe same day, maybe next day. Maybe uh, they will arrest you on the Friday. Then Saturday, Sunday, you are there in jail. And on Monday, you will be uh, taken to the court and court will grant you the bill. So that is very miserable condition.
that is a non bailable uh, and if it is bailable the chowki police chowki will give the bail and you come to home happily second is cognizable what is cognizable cognizable and non cognizable there are two terms non cognizable is simple one cognizable means the police can take cognizance of that and on their own without the order of magistrate the police officer the uh, inspector circle inspector or the psi may start investigation and they may arrest the doctor that is a cognizable and non compoundable non compoundable means court ke bahar hum sula nahi kar sakte ek bar kis chalu ho gaya so it has to go till end uska result aana hi chahiye because the, uh, isme jo non compoundable case sahi pcp indit name to payment kaise case rehte dr ajay mani versus government of maharashtra dr girjawag against government of uh, delhi likewise it will be it won't be dr ajay mani versus girja okay तो एक बार वो केस अंदर दाखिल हो गई कोर्ट में सो इट हैज टू गो टू अनदर एंड नॉन रिटर्न वॉल है उसमें सो इट इज अ नॉन कंपाउंडेबल आउट ऑफ कोर्ट सेटलमेंट इसमें नहीं हो सकता है सो इट इज अंजरस सिचुएशन एंड एंड रेगरस इंप्रिजनमेंट मीन चक्की पीसिंग एंड पीसिंग ओनली इंप्रिजनमेंट इज डिफरेंट एंड रेगरस इंप्रिजनमेंट मीन यू हैव टू वर्क देयर टू टू सेवन ईयर इट इज अ डेंजरस सो एंटिसिपेट डॉक्यूमेंट प्रॉपर एंड टेक होम मेसेज इज ऑट फॉलो ऑल प्रोटोकॉल्स पॉक्सो एक्ट एम टी पी एक्ट एंड पीसीपी एक्ट document well and accordingly keep train staff because these are the persons who uh, make you land in trouble okay training and drills regularly usko pucha patient shock mein hai prostodin la oh the prostodin kidhar hai madam are wo udhar rakha hai fridge mein fridge kidhar hai i am new yesterday join ho gayi ye jo hai na ye nahi hota fir usme regular drills hota hai have a system in hospital and keep good relation with the colleagues because colleagues are the only person who will help you in bad situation everybody will enjoy your bad situation but colleagues will be they are to help you okay and i pray to god nobody will uh, should go to this uh, position and nobody should uh, need my help but if needed i am there always i have a, a photograph of this page and it is free of cost 100% this is women empowerment in israel this is women empowerment in india salute to this dr captain deepika chidri she is at chana glacier gun for nation and state of for the unit and uh, this is the lower most chain of the uh, health services immunization done see in which condition they are working salute to them also and salute to complete womanhood as we have uh, celebrated yesterday women's day but by my opinion total 365 days are women's day okay so congratulations to all women and uh, greetings from me uh, for the women's year not the day okay and this is my humble request to all of you to kindly vote for me was vice president foxy west zone and second opinion uh, second uh, vote dr girja my sister uh, there are two posts from west zone and all other zones are having one post so kindly vote for all of us thank you thank you very much very nice uh, there's a very practical points you have uh, conveyed to all the viewers and if there are any questions uh, viewers can pose them we can uh, yes. put forth to dr ajay mane if you want yes ma'am yes ma'am So one major query. Uh, very informative. Some, yeah. Very exhaustive some, and very simple. Yeah. Some members had the newer forms. Previously, we used to get this Bayer Act. It was published by certain, you know, book houses. We used to get those uh, Bayer Acts, and we used to keep them to get yes. all the formats and forms. Now with the newer uh, this thing, because I am in a government setup, uh, means I'll get uh, all the forms through my uh, district or state nodal officers. But there was uh, there was a concern among our private practitioners that where do they get these forms from? Are they available? Yeah, there online? there are two sources, ma'am. One online, it is available. First of all, government of India. Uh, Minister of Health and Family Welfare. They have made available first thing. Second, in uh, published gadget, they have given this form. And third, your local approved authority, the civil surgeon or the M O H or the chief medical officer of all corporations, they are having the format of the all forms. You can demand them, and they will give you the all forms. New M T P Act also, sir. No. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Okay. The district health yes. office uh, will give it. District health office. Yes. yes. And Ajay, uh, what about yes, the, Gerija, ma'am? What about the status of medical boards in your uh, region? Yeah, 
now the current challenges are I, that is exactly what i was going, going to come to you for an appeal we still have challenges very strict challenges of access to misoprostol and ru486 easily yeah. not available then you know sometimes we need misoprostol for non mtp re related issues but that also making available is quite difficult and then we have to keep on writing somebody says one rule somebody says other rule now as of now despite there being a permission for doing a you know terminations at 24 weeks we are not finding it very easy to do it in our country especially in our particular locality because now for example my institution is saying uh, did we get any directive from the district health officer then where are we going to write it what is that new form so these challenges are continuing to affect us i again want to feel, see that what we can do in our practices we can maybe reach out to the world around at least when the patient comes to you at 12 weeks of gestation write dates actually i do that ki itne week ko ye sonography tumhari anomaly scan honi hi honi hai yeah because then you get that window of maybe some 10 days to take a call a second opinion do a second sonography and then consider termination well within 20 weeks because yeah. 24 weeks termination we should keep it for those hapless women who are probably unmarried or women who are having really really unsalvageable abnormalities yes. that is what i but, take on but girija i'll tell you what happens sometimes yeah. patient comes late and she has had an anomaly scan and hmm. as you have done an amniocentesis and the report comes out okay whatever say it's a whatever report comes out where it requires termination so what happens is come what may sometimes you have no choice but to do a termination earlier times what used to happen was people were very scared they would refer patients to institutions and we would put the date as you know maybe 20 weeks and still do it or put it as a pprom and do it but abhi kya hua now because the law has agreed in inr hospital the uh, medical officers who's in charge of all this says i am still waiting for a directive from the state government to change the form exactly so ajay that form has still not yet come so yeah. second thing i also want to ask which you which form ma'am which form you know the, the second C form for termination beyond 24 weeks. weeks yeah it is form e na it is there ma'am yeah. i'll send you no, the no. copy no, no it is there but no. apre hospital mein karte hi nahi na wo bolte hum to aaya nahi abhi tak to nahi aaya no 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 just now see today's incidents i'll tell you one one civil surgeon called me uh, from our region basically from satara and uh, he said ki sir uh, ye amendment ho chuke hai par uh, uska jo hai humko change karke lena padega uh, aap sab ka bola sir aisa nahi hai it is clearly given in gazette ki usko no need of change even the government people they don't know and about medical board i'll tell you 19 boards are there in maharashtra out of 38 uh, districts 19 boards are formed basically the medical board must be ready at every district level and the civil surgeon is a uh, chairman of that or the uh, head of department of gynec uh, department of government medical college can be the uh, chairman but it should be gazetted and then and then only that medical board has got a power to uh, give the opinion likewise it is there okay. so it, it, it is there are so many institutions who have directly said we don't do any termination in second trimester now yeah, that's, even that's our mere... government members are not doing in, right. uh, we pune sasun refuses to do second trimester correct correct that Because is that should not be there or you to come to bharti now bharti mm. since i am not the hod currently i have to ask the unit head and my hod who half of the times are refusing they say yeah, obviously no. So, so we are scared. Them? Nothing, so nothing much more. We are scared. Where will they go? Is my question. Huh? Yeah. That 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 is the thing. That is about the means. Doctor Ajay Mane and all the, my seniors like Sutitra Ma'am and uh, uh, Girija Ma'am. I want to, I want you to comment upon rights of refusal by a service provider. So, yes. what is we, your we, opinion? Yeah, ma'am. We, I told you, unless and until life-threatening condition is there, we can refuse the patient. okay and on religious grounds you know there are catholics and there are jains who That's do it. not nation so yeah. they say please go away somewhere else they don't do it yeah ajay there is one more question uh, yeah ma'am doing a medicated abortion you know hmm. normally you fill in the forms everything's okay and some products are left behind so quite often times i tell the patients take the fourth fourth tablet which is there 
I mean, the process and everything will be okay. But there are times they have to undergo a second lot of the same tablet. They don't want to have a, a evacuation by a surgical method. So in okay. that case, do you actually need to fill in the form again? It doesn't make sense. No, no, no. no. So then same as you. How if, do you justify the, the misoprostol? Yeah, if the consultant is same and the patient is same, you do not have to give them the separate number. But they're still but, taking a signature on a form on a pink colored form. They're still taking a signature. No, to that that, that can be another. Need... No, that can be another separate consent that uh, uh, for these uh, products of conception which are remaining, we are taking uh, another tablets. That can be a separate consent. But no need to give the MTP number and no all formality should be right. done. Okay. Yes, yeah. that's, that's clear then. So, so then, continues, we have to sort out our own way and sometimes yeah. definitely remain in the legal framework and don't do anything wrong is very important <laughs> because, you know, sometimes I'll tell you an experience where <clears throat> a patient, I did a DNA, uh, medicated termination for a missed abortion. Mm -hmm. She had a missed abortion. She was threatening to abort and then she had a missed abortion and then we did. Meanwhile, her husband was staying, uh, staying, staying overseas and they were communicating with me and with each other. And he was saying that she wants to continue pregnancy, early first pregnancy, but unfortunately and fortunately for me, it landed in missed abortion and we terminated. Yeah. Now, immediately after three months, there is a notice which comes from the police to me saying that XYZ patient has complained and said that I, along with her husband, have been in confidence with each other and have gone and terminated her pregnancy. Yeah, that's the routine situation. Very situation. common and routine situation. Yes. Yeah, but I'm telling you, Ajay, my challenge was I did this consultation in one clinic, administered the MTP pills in a registered place in Apollo, and mm. fortunately, what saved me was all my documents. Documentation. Yes, yes. The admission documentations so are very important. Writing on the paper, counseling, husband has this issue, husband has called on WhatsApp, Anna, Anna, Anna. <laughs> and then I took all the clear was of chat my name mail me copy karke hai. Yeah. That is true. That yes, is accepted by the yeah. in court. I know that this is an evidence which I have. Yeah. There are yeah. two, you there should are, yeah. Ajay Mane sir, there are two, three questions. Uh -huh. uh, one is a sixteen year old girl asking for MTP pill. She has come with seven weeks pregnancy. No. Should police be informed? Informed. Yes. Yes. informed police. Yes, yes. The answer is a big yes. Then she continues to ask, Dr. Veena uh, Panda has asked this again, West Bengal court has increased uh, the termination of pregnancy. It can be done up to 34 weeks. What is your no. opinion? See, basically what happens, West Bengal has given one verdict uh, because the patient had gone to high court. No, now there is no need to go to high court as medical boards are there. In last month, only uh, this uh, incidence took place. That, uh, see, the medical board is there. We can terminate pregnancy up to 34 lay, up to 38 weeks also. There is no out uh, limit, outer limit given yes, for yes. the medical board. Yeah, but uh, the lower limit is 24 onwards. May go to any extent. So it is not the discretion of court. It is the discretion of the medical board. And where medical board is not available, then and then only you need to go to court. Then there is one question for me. Do you think that sex education should be started by parents? Yes. Obviously. Uh, yeah, obviously. 100%. Means the parents are the first teachers and the, uh, the children are very comfortable uh, with their father or mother as such. So we should be the first teachers. Um, actually, we should be like a friend to our uh, growing children so that they do not feel any hesitation in coming and talking to us about everything. Correct. So I think, uh, yes, parents are the first teachers and they should uh, introduce sex education to their children. So if there are uh, no more questions, then uh, we can call it a day. So Chitra ma'am, your final comments. Yes. No, I just like to say it was very interesting because, you know, adolescent problems, uh, so yeah. we have to keep on meeting and keep on doing a brainstorming and, you know, medical legal Ye bhi issues because you know as you are doing practice numerous new situations evolve where you need medical legal help so when you have some uh, friendly medical legal person around so you know you can just pick up the phone and ask look this is the situation what do i do so yeah. that always helps and particularly i'm telling you in institutions you're still better off when you're doing your own private practice that is a hazardous, hazardous. 
absolutely yeah. understand. So you you just need help at that time. So I think this is an excellent uh, webinar where both uh, Anita and Mala have done a wonderful job, and you know all the speakers, including uh, Ajay, who stepped in as the twelfth. But I think the twelfth person sometimes wonderful. This makes a century. Century, my dear. Sir, deep the match. Tadiya, sir, you have. Any there? So thank you, thank you. You have given me chance. Thank you, madam. Thank you. No, no. Excellent, okay. excellent thank celebration, so Doctor Ajay Mane. It was the and need of the hour. Let's wish all, all each other best of luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all are contestant, and we wish everybody should be uh, who are present today yeah. here. My sincere thanks to Sujitra Ma'am, Girija Ma'am, Ajay Sir, and everybody who has joined us, respected faculty, Ruma. Excellent uh, lecture uh, presentation by you. Uh, it was very informative. and uh, it's our hard luck that we could not uh, have the panel discussion but i i promise that we will bring this panel once again with the uh, dear dr mala and my and we will have this panel again actually yes. two of our panelists got busy yeah one was not no. one was having fever that is good thing madam uh, we are we are doing one uh, uh, project rather myself and dr gorak mandrupkar in islampur uh, yeah. we are advising these pcos adolescent girls uh, to perform omkar or brahmari pranayam for 15 to 20 minutes every day and okay. we are getting very good results okay because it uh, because it stimulates the pituitary gland and uh, the uh, hormonal level is maintained should i give so, you an additional uh, decoction for this which we work in with our pharmacy and ayurvedic department you yes, every day ask them to take one tablespoon full of turmeric and one tablespoon full of amla juice okay twice right. daily with water ask them to do that one group you can tell them to do that yeah another group will add that yeah, yeah. we are we getting the good results in the, in the process of publishing this we studied it is about 60 patients mm -hmm. and we found good results okay so great you great supposed to be a very good anti inflammatory yeah curcumin is my sincere Anna. thanks to all the delegates also who have joined and uh, actively participated in the discussion and uh Uh, uh, at last i will uh, be failing in my duty if i do not thank dr tipika chabra and her team thank you jackson fall for always being so so responsible in doing your job in a very particular and uh, you know perfect way so thank, thank you. you thank you very much uh, jackson fall people and uh, my sincere thanks to dr mala for making adolescent health committee uh, aogd a partner in this event mala you will like to say something no thanks to everyone and good night and goodbye everybody has put in their great efforts and this evening was really a great learning from jackson pal i would also like to take this opportunity and present before you our uh, only brand which contains 100% natural lycopene with phytonutrients that's our lyco red soft gel the cell protector also we have cyclorex cr10 control release norethistron tablets 10 mg for freedom from menstrual irregularities dynogest 2 mg tablets as endorex from our nari division of jackson <laughs> then we have for pcos stelia group that is stelia m which is the myanositol dicyroinositol combination of 40 to 1 ratio and also cyproton acetate ethanol estradiol tablets of cystelia 35 the most effective oc pill for pcos so thank you all very much and we hope to see you again next in our uh, next program which is on antenatal care being organized by the um, mamsi of uh, new delhi yeah. along with narchi so thank you all uh, aogd fetal medicine and sub committee of uh, genetics sure sure thank you everyone pranam sachitra ma'am and my regards to all thanks. the faculty bye bye thank you bye bye thank you madam thank you very much thank you